Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome onto the stage Richard Weiss, who is uh, an Olympian and founder and CEO of Living the Dream Foundation. Richard is the founder of Athletes Pro. He is an Australian Olympian in 96, and he's a three-time world team member in 95, 97, and 98 when he came to Australia. This evening, Richard will talk about his past, his life, and his sporting experiences that contributed greatly to what he became today and what he established with the Living the Dream Foundation. Please all welcome him onto the stage. Thank you. I would like to congratulate you for, you know, for the 100 years. It, it is a big thing. I mean, being active for 100 years, it, it does show the impact you make in a community in Australia and people who are involved in the Rotary Club. It's, it's very impactful. So it's good to be part of that. Um, tonight will be a little bit more about myself and also how the Living the Dream Foundation uh, was founded. And then I'm going to be talking about a little bit about the future and of where we're headed. First of all, I do like to acknowledge the committee of um, members for the Living the Dream Foundation. We have a Drew, Tan, Iwa, Rande, and we do have Simon who will hopefully join us online uh, tonight. So, hi, Simon. And I also would like to um, welcome Robert. Robert, it's um, my new CEO mentor that's been appointed to help me how to grow in my role as a CEO. I okay. have the story about me. All right. I was born five years after 1968, Russian occupation of the Czechoslovakia, and it took us 16 years to escape it. My parents married young in their early 20s, and I always will remember them as loving and caring. We were a typical working class household, both parents working hard, surrounded by surrounded with many friends and families. My parents had a good sense of pride. They knew who they were, and they also they knew, they knew who, where they come from. They had self-esteem, they were self-driven, confident, and they knew their place in the society. Unfortunately, there was a marital challenge that my parents experienced and did have a ma massive negative impact on the well-being of the whole family. Unfortunately, my parents split. I was introduced to the sport of Olympic wrestling when I was six years old. And from an early age, I demonstrated um, a talent for the sport. Uh, at the age of 10, I was recruited to a a government sports school, which is very similar to what Australia would call it as Australian civil sport. So at the age of 10, I was already training twice a day, school in between, and then training in the evening. I was doing that for six years. Um, the school was also a place of excellence where elite athletes were developed and nurtured to become the true representative of socialist regime. Um, I had a great coaches and not having father, this was an important place for me, a place where coaches were mentors and mentors that invested their skill and their time to see young boys become men. This was another place in my life where self-esteem, confidence and pride were daily medicine. We all knew our place and we had strong sense of belonging. When I was 15, my mom told us that we're going to escape the social system and she was planning our escape. I arrived in Australia in November 1989 in Sydney. We moved in a new home in Newcastle. No English, not knowing the culture, no language, no friends, no family. So we started very humbly, you know, at the beginnings where very humble. We move into a small house. Me and my sister engage in a school and we enjoy our freedom of our new home in Australia. In 1990, we have relocated to Melbourne and it's here where I met Sam Parker, the national wrestling coach um, for Australia. He was located at the Victoria University of Technology in Footscray. Again, this was a place of excellence. Olympians, world team members, Commonwealth champions and medalist, a perfect place for 16 year old athlete to begin his career in Australia. I became a top pick to represent Australia in 1992. 
uh, for 68 and 69 kilograms. Opportunity give, give me a privilege to travel the world, but in the same time experience diversity of different cultures. And I was always fascinated by the, by the way people were living, especially who lived a similar life as I lived. In 1999, I met my wife um, in Australia. She's Australian from Frankston. And in um, 2001, we got married. In 2003, we decided to move to Mongolia to study the language and hoping to work with Mongolian investment com community. Once again, <laughs> I moved into a place <laughs> with no culture, no language, no family, and no friends. Because of my passion for the sport, I, um, I did well in Mongolia. I um, got a job at the National Institute of Physical Education. I was assistant coach for freestyle wrestling coaches. I was working with the coaches, working with the athletes, and working with the community. Um, our firstborn son, Samuel, he was adopted in, um, in Mongolia. We got him from a local orphanage in 2004, and in 2006, we had our second child, Dora Lucia, and we actually had to come to Australia for the birth um, because that's what we were required to do as an expat in Mongolia. When we return to Australia, to Mongolia, um, the life was a little bit challenging um, for us being parents because we become parents to two children very quickly. So um, we actually moved back to Australia. And when we moved back to Australia, um, I ended up with no job. I basically was unemployed. I was no longer working uh, in the sports school. Um, I basically had to start from the scratch. And um, as I started working as a personal trainer, I started to identify in a community some of the kids who came from poor, poorer families uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, they had no access to um, local membership, gym memberships, gyms, um, the people struggle financially. And um, so I thought, why can we set up as something that created access for these disadvantaged uh, young people where they can enter for free and have a personal trainer and, and, and a gym? Um, let me just... So for me, it was basically, there are a lot of kids in a community who were living the dream. They had parents, they had families, they had the financial needs, they were engaged in school, they could do a lot of things. But there were also a lot of kids who did not live the dream. So that's what the name of Living the Dream Foundation started. As you can see on a, on a slide, we'll see that um, bit of a history of Living the Dream Foundation. The foundation was kind of founded in 2008, 2009. In 2011, we got the DGR status. 2012, we got the DGR status. And then we're starting to establish a programs that were impactful. The first program was well-being engagement program. And that was very much focused on fitness, free access to fitness for disadvantaged young people. As we were working with some of the kids that laughed coming to the gym, because they had no, nowhere else to go. You know, if it was nowhere else to go, they would end up on the streets, smoking, drinking, rebelling, and getting in trouble with the law. So there was a good way for them to come in and kind of invest their time in something positive. Once we start talking to the young people and the parents, we realize that some of the kids needed a mentors. I come from single parent home. I know what it feels like when you lose bad. And it was very difficult. It was very challenging. So mentoring became a program that allowed us to communicate with the young people and be more like a life coach for them, where they can share their stories, their hardship, their burdens, and we can help them and we can guide them. I'm not sure if I'm pressing the right. Okay. 
Uh, so this is the well-being engagement. Very much what I just say, it was all about engaging young people in sport. Then we had the mentoring, and it was just providing guidance, becoming a life coach to somebody who really needed a mentor. When we talked to some of our clients, we realized that their needs were too bigger for us. So we established a member care. Member care was a place where we can kind of provide a, find a, somebody in the community who can help them and provide, can assist their need. And that's what the, and that's what the member care was founded and established. Who are our clients? Well, our clients are very much a young people who dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety, are disengaged from school, are disengaged from employment, you know, experience a lack of motivation. Our community, it's also recognized as a low socioeconomic community, which was very much a lot of struggling families, single parents' families, a lot of struggling young people. So what we did, we basically opened the door and just helped them coming through. The organization grew from nothing to about 100, around 100, up to, up, up to 100 members each year. I was very much the main person on the ground doing the work, doing the hard work. When the COVID came, it impacted everybody. It was even more harder for the families who already struggled. For us, because we kind of relied on face-to-face -face engagement and a lot of people, a lot of young people and families needed that. They wanted that face-to-face. -face. It was very important for them. When the COVID, COVID came, it kind of took it away. A lot of services closed the door as soon as the restrictions came in. Living the Dream Foundation was probably the only one organization at the time where we can actually maintain our face-to-face -face contact as long as we were outside. After when the restrictions hardened up a little bit more, we were no longer doing that. We moved all our engagement online and we did most of our clients through remote experiences. That was really good experience for us. We learned something new and they also learned how to engage remotely. The COVID itself, made young people feel um, they were not connected to the services. Obviously, there were a lot of services that had to close the door. They struggled to do remote mentoring and counseling. They wanted to do something more positive. They had a lot of limited access to support services. They were further disengaged from school, employment, and other employment opportunities. They're also starting to experience financial hardships as they're not able to work. With experiencing COVID, we kind of, I look at and kind of, we, we look at our clients and I thought, what else we can do better? Um, what does our future look like? We have a lot of clients, I'm the one man person. I have my committee who are helping me to run, run the show. And we felt like we need to do expand and we need to have a new direction. Healthy community, this is why I have a division for Frankston. We're living the dream is a place where young people receive support to turn loss into a purpose. We will continue run our core programs, which is well-being mentoring and member care. We know our why. Living the dream exists on the principle of solidarity, you know, uh, where we get to provide caring and empathy driven environment, a culture where young people are empowered to make positive changes and are equipped to overcome adversity and work towards improving the quality of life so they can become vibrant and active members of our society. Our top priorities will be reduce poverty, improve mental health, and crime prevention. The targeted cohort will be families and young people on low income, 
women and girls with poor mental health, young people caught up in the youth justice system, young people experiencing poverty and homelessness, unemployed and disengaged young people. Healthy Community Project will be community-driven solution to address the demand and the needs of the children and young people in our community. Young people who come through the doors of Living the Dream Foundation will improve their physical and mental health. They will learn practical skills, gain knowledge to learn new life skills and habits, increase sense of self-reliance, resilience, readiness and confidence, and also provide access to required networks and support. Some of our clients will experience short, medium, long-term um, outcomes. For example, I'll give you um, an example of a story of a client that came in um, last year, young female who was um, struggling with uh, substance um, abuse. And um, after working with her, well being, engaging in fitness, doing mentoring and, and talking, we create an action plan that now she's um, not dependent on substance. Now that's a, that's a positive story, that's one year. Some of the clients might um, kind of go for a little bit longer, but I know from my experience working with young people that everybody's different. We had clients who've been with us for past four years, we have clients who've been around for six months, one term. Now we have starting to get a lot of young kids with behavioral issues because schools are no longer providing for their complex needs, behavioral needs. So they come to us looking for solutions. Basically, we open the door, we let them tackle the tackle bags, we let them lift weights, climb the ride. Of course, everything has to be safe. But they enjoy themselves. They can be themselves. You know, they're not judged. They're not criticized. Parents love it. We get a very good feedback about the work that we do with the young people. Now, our age group now, it's from eight plus to 25. So we're really going to focus on working with the young families, young people, and young adults. I think the next slide itself was more about expanding partnership and the impact. Um, when I mentioned at the beginning that um, being part of something like Rotary Club of Melbourne for 100 years, you have made a dramatic impact on the communities and people involved obviously participated in that. Um, I would like to see Living the Dream Foundation go for that long, even longer if it's possible. We'll be looking for partnership that allows us to do so. Now, we like to expand. I like to learn how to be the, you know, how to lead the organization well, how to pass on my responsibility with our clients, with our new staff, and then we can expand to other local areas, a lot of areas like the Frankston, low, low socioeconomic communities. That's where I would like to know. And that's where I like to go. Um, I'm not really sure how much time do I have. Okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Um, I would like to say thank you for having me. This is this will be a good experience. I got a lot to learn from. Um, if there are any questions, please ask. Thank you. Really, really good to say. Um, I will start with the first question, if that's okay. Do you do you outsource all of your staff and the support that you give to the to the community, or is it in house, or how do you actually do that? Um, how we do our service? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm actually I'm the only person who does all the work. So mm -hmm. I basically I I. <laughs> yeah. So it's um. I open the gym at about 8, 30, 9 o'clock and we close the doors around 4 o'clock. Um, so we have um, previously before the COVID, we would have five clients, six clients per day. After COVID, because of cleaning and kind of safety issues, we can only have four clients per day. 
Yeah, so I'm trying to fit everybody in. Yeah. Yeah, so, and in regards how I do it, well, we get our own funding from um, private people who kind of support and believe in the work that we do. And that's what allows us to do with our service. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Does the organization work with relevant government departments and have a lot of organizations working in the same space or spaces, even in a particular geographical area? And how are the programs funded? Okay, so um, we we look at in Frankston, we're about 12 minutes from Frankston City. Um, it's a walking distance. Um, in 2018 and 19, we're starting to develop a very close relationship with Frankston Council, uh, especially the youth services. Um, because of the work and how we work with our clients, we got a lot of referrals from um, some um, Brother of St. Lawrence, Headspace, Youth Justice. We got more engaged working with the Frankston Courts working with the at-risk children. So we kind of uh, broaden our network. Our funding basically comes from, from writing applications and grants, and it's private. And we're not connected at this stage with any government funding. No government funding. No government funding at this stage. I've just got a question around, um, you, you've said that obviously you've got uh, clients who are in there for six months or a year or four years or what happens I guess is there like a graduation process like how do you know that the client has graduated through and through, you mentioned about yeah do you so like, do you bring them back potentially to help with bringing you know helping other people to show that there is a step forward or yeah look it really depends on on the needs of the young person if we have a young person who would come from youth justice system, um, they might be facing a court and they need to engage because of they've been given a diversion. Uh, and usually diversion provides them with pro positive engagement. So they try to engage with organizations that work with the young people. Um, when they when they come to us, um, they do their, let's say they do their two week sessions or three week sessions. And then they might get in trouble again, and then kind of they have to go back into the system, you know, to kind of, um, I guess, do the time for what they have done. We have clients with, um, for example, with complex needs. And when they come through the door, we ask them, how are we going to work together? That usually is done through meet and greet session. Usually it takes for about 30 minutes to one hour. And uh, we asked the question, if we are to work together, what is that going to look like? As many young people who come through the door, they know we focus on physical health. We're looking for them to really get engaged because they're actually not doing anything, right? So that's the foot in the door for them. Through that, we can kind of expand into more, more of a mentoring. And when they write their goals, they have to be a little bit more specific what they really want to achieve. So sometimes those goals can uh, be achieved. I want to uh, get confidence getting back to school. I want to feel good about myself. And that's what we basically work on with the, each client. Did that answer your questions? Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's right. Um, one of the slides that you did have, it featured um, sports engagement for asylum seekers. Can you tell us a bit about that program? I'm just going to sorry repeat the question for the people online because they can't hear. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the question was about sports and asylum. So on one of the slides, yes. it featured um, sports engagement for asylum seekers. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, 
So in 2013, um, I got a phone call from um, Ains, which was uh, one of the um, organizations working in Denham that was dealing with uh, uh, asylum seekers coming to Australia. And uh, they find me online because I did wrestling, basically. So they call me up and say, um, are you the wrestling coach? We have a couple of asylum seekers who we'll say they're wrestlers. Would you like to see them? And of, of course, I'm saying, of course, they yeah. So um, they come down. Um, there were two of them. Um, I remember their names. It was Salim and Najib. And um, we just basically become very good friends. And we opened a program for asylum seekers because it was suitable at that time for Living the Dream Foundation as well. And it was a huge support for the funding for them to re-engage. I learned a lot from working with our asylum seekers. The program went for four years and we, I think we got up to 40 asylum seekers engaged in the program. We wrestle, we play soccer in Denmark. We took them to wrestling nationals, competitions. We ate Afghan food with them. You know, it, it was fantastic. I mean, the 40 came to the club, but as I was engaging myself more and more in that, area in the community, I think that that's, that's the key in the work that we do our best. It's actually go out there to get to know the people. And that's what I did. And directly, we were at 40 young, young men. Indirectly, I would say probably over 200 Afghan people that we have met through the whole process of 40 years. It was a fantastic experience. It was very good. Yeah. Unfortunately, when the visa changed for them, a lot of them were able to get work and they were no longer in need because when they came to Australia, they had no work. They could not work. They only had mates. There were six or seven guys living uh, per household. You know, they had nothing else to do all day long. Afghanistan's got strong history in wrestling. They love their soccer. Boom, we can provide that, we can deliver. We can work with them, and that's what we did. So, we, yeah, that was a very successful program. Yeah, is that answer your question? <laughs> yes, Jim. So, at, at a high level, I mean, if you were, if this audience was, you know, federal government members, given you know the the, the, the people that you have met and worked with, what what? Recommendations to be made to Australian government to you know, reduce the need for you know, the services and programs that we have. What's important that we do that we don't do That's a very good question. I think the opportunity for a lot of young people who came from poorer homes, they struggle financially. They can't access. They can access services when they can talk about their mental health issues, which I think it's brilliant, it's fantastic, it's important. But I, I do find out that a lot of young people, they need to be active, they need to be out doing something positive. And to having an environment like ours, that they're coming, our place is set up. We're dealing with a lot of young people with, with complex needs. We're dealing with uh, young women who, um, struggle with their mental health due to trauma. Um, we have uh, young people who, um, transgender people, we, you know, like they, they, they come from various backgrounds. Our place, it's a safe place. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one sessions. We do have group sessions that we provide for our schools, the school, local schools that we work for. And that's why our clients like what we do. We provide a one-on-one, -on -one private engagement where they some of their anxiety can be removed. They can feel themselves, be themselves, and they can open up a little more. And by doing so, we can kind of guide them and direct, direct them in the right areas where they can get a better support. So if we can have facilities and micro hubs set up in Australia, they are funded for, let's say, three staff people who are passionate about physical activity, strength and conditioning coaches. Um, they love the idea of mentoring younger people. Those micro hubs can facilitate, we do well, up to 100 people a year 
If you have micro hubs set up all around Australia, that's a lot of people that you can help. Um, that's what I think that would be my recommendation, providing that opportunity for those kind of things to play take place. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I'll, you set this up in Frankston. Um, yes. I live on the other side, which is Hoxcrofton, but there's a very large micro population in Hoxcrofton. So if you were to set up something, you, you mentioned you do everything yourself, and that's probably not scalable. Yeah. How would you implement this program in other locations that probably need the same sort of help? Okay, so to answer that question, I basically, the 10 years of experience setting up Living the Dream Foundation in Frankston can be, can be duplicated. Um, that's why we have a point of CEO mentor to help me kind of um, learn a little bit more how to replicate what we do in different areas, in different locations. I did identify, yes, I am the main man, but being one person, there is a lot of pressure. You're dealing with a lot of kids, a lot of, lot of needs. Um, having three people as a staff would require, I would believe would require three staff to run a micro hub that will facilitate a program. We also kind of look into the, the community where this, we kind of go on the, you know, the Australian, the, um, you know, the, the census data. And we look at the level of disadvantage and we connect with their community and council and people. And then we basically kind of starting to structure how we approach working with our clients. So we we'll basically we do everything the same way. It will be just different people involved doing that. If, I hope that's answered your question. It's very replicable. It's very easy to be done. It's just obviously it's having the funding and finding the right people who have the passion working with the young people. Not everybody has empathy. I think for me, I think for years, I have strong empathy. I think I learned a lot in my life. So when pe people come to me, there is no, how would I say it? Um, you know, six months, all right, you out. We deal with you, you know, problem solved, problem not solved. We don't do that. You know, some of our clients leave for personal reasons, and we get that. We understand that. But we make the call, just checking in. How are you doing? What's happening? You know, and that's important. We can do that. As an organization, we can do that. It's important. And we can do the same thing in other areas. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. That's great. I'm going to pass it to Stephen now. I hand over to the president. Richard, on behalf of the club, would like to thank you for sharing your story okay. um, and, and your stories with Rotary Mill and also aligning those values. We, we do have a past president who okay. famously has, uh, Phil Embersby, who has 400% made in Australia, bamboo, hyperbolic socks that just make you super fit, Richard. So <laughs> I'm sure you can wear these with some of your clients and show them that having warm feet yeah. uh, is a privilege, I right. guess, for some people can't. So yeah. um, again, Thank you again, Richard. Yeah, Please thank, um, you. thank Richard. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Wow, that's uh, for those who are online, and hello to our home viewers out there, and to those in the room as well. Um, it was a real honour to be able to hear Richard tonight, and and hear about your background, and and really from what you came from, from. Yeah, from sort of a communist single parent background to be an Olympian representing Australia um, to doing what you're doing today. It's um, a it's very inspirational story and, it, and it's an honour for us to be in the same room as, as you. So thank you very much. <laughs>